chair over there. And all of these people here. <laughs> no, no over there, okay? We'll be wired up, and this is to tape in case. Okay, yes, indeed. In case your stops or something. Sure. <laughs> I got, you can get that numerous times or yeah, we can provide a transcript for you. How have you been, Warren? Marlon, thank you very much. How was fishing? I just got back from Yellowstone and uh, escaped the fires. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't look singed a bit. No, I didn't get singed a bit. <laughs> I, hope, I hope some of the people out there don't uh, keep singeing yeah. you all. <laughs> well, this morning there's an entirely different story in the Post for the first time. They're now citing that it doesn't look as bad as it's been made to look in all these times and that even in some places I was amazed. Uh, well, they've got snow now, which slowed yes. things down. Yeah, it snowed Saturday night. But he said that uh, the vegetation and so forth is actually already beginning to, to grow in some of the blacked out spaces. I know you take the rosy view of things. Uh, uh, close up, it doesn't look that way to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I imagine it must look pretty horrible, but I, I think uh, this was a surprise to me in their, yes. that particular yes. paper doing this. Can I do a follow on that issue? Because uh, there, there seems to be an argument that this is either going to be a Waterloo for the environmentalists who have always argued against selective burning mm -hmm. and for let it burn. Or it's going to be a Waterloo for the administration which didn't move perhaps fast enough. Well, we think we got into it <laughs> very fast, but we have, uh, and as you know, I just sent Don Hodell and Gling and Taft from the Defense Department out there and they're reporting to me this afternoon on that. But already steps have been made to increase the amount of personnel and plus that thing of, of accepting Canada's offer to yes. make uh, men and equipment available. So uh, I think we're doing all that we, we can do. I must say I was surprised. I did not know there was a policy in the parks you of didn't. not putting out the fires. That, was, that preceded us. In, yes, and, uh, many years. I was, I was very surprised and when Don Hodel went out there the first time, uh, <laughs> he informed them that, uh, no, we were going to fight the fires. So you do think that the Park Service perhaps was traveling on a policy that you wouldn't have agreed with if you, had you known it was in effect? I, I think I would have disagreed, uh -huh. yes. Along That's another uh, line of disagreement, uh, currently in the news, before I get on to a couple of other more basic questions, uh, how do you feel about Vice President Bush's uh, change of heart on the minimum wage? I know you have opposed a minimum wage increase. Well, the, the, the general minimum wage, because every time it's happened, uh, there has been an increase in unemployment. Yes. But no, I've long felt, and I think he and I are in, in agreement, and that is that, uh, uh, yes, at the present uh, low rate, there could be some increase because of the inflation that has taken place, but not the figures that were being talked because we don't want to make it to such a point that it would add to unemployment uh, when we're going the other way. Do you have a figure on that? And um, well, I, I would hesitate to suggest one right now. We've, uh, we haven't specified one, right. talked in maybe some general terms about a range of that, but with this, what we would like uh, accompanying uh, such an increase would be the thing we've asked for and we've been refused so far by Congress and that is a lower what you might say as a training minimum wage. For the uh, minimum use. That's right. That some, so that you could take people in that are actually being to give them training and so forth and that at present rates uh, I'm sure the employers won't do it. Uh, one last uh, news type question on the textile bill. Will you veto the textile bill? I am very much of a mind that the way, the way it appears and what we're seeing now on the Hill, yes, that it is purely protectionist and you must will. be vetoed. Okay. Um, going on, uh, in your um, looking forward uh, to retirement, so to speak, what would you regard as your greatest triumph um, in economic policy in the past seven or eight years? What in the economic policy, uh, something that I have believed uh, for a great share of my life and that was the the tax policies of the government as they had been and the extreme progressiveness and so forth were inimical to uh, recovery and to uh, economic progress and the fact that I believe the our tax cuts and reforms are the very base of what has brought about this economic recovery which 
we understand is now the longest in the history of the country and the most successful. And uh, you get the tax uh, changes, the yes, principal. I, I uh, think the tax, the that. tax uh, situation. It was one that was um, uh, there was no incentive provided at all. The incentives, for example, in the upper brackets were incentives to find tax dodges and so forth. And the result has been we're getting more revenue now than uh, at the lower rates than we were getting at the at the higher rates. From the higher taxpayer bracket yeah. taxpayers. In fact, back in my days when I never had conceived of an idea that I might ever be in public life or public office, I always, uh, however, believed in helping and supporting the causes I believed in. And, and as I've often said in Hollywood, if you don't sing or dance, you wind up as an after-dinner speaker. So I was out on the mashed potato circuit a great deal and did my own speeches and chose my own subjects. And I was denouncing the tax structure for many years. What, uh, along that line, on the flip side of that question, what would you regard as your greatest disappointment uh, in the economic policy area? That we still have not been able to get the constitutional amendment to a balanced budget and to get the president what 43 governors have, and that is uh, the line item veto. I had it in, as a governor of California. I used it 943 times and was never overridden once. And uh, for a president to not have that, it just uh, is a denial of a power that I think could be one of the most helpful things in getting back to a balanced budget. If you were, if there were no 25th Amendment and you were about to enter your third term, and many would like that, I'm sure. Uh, what would be the number one item on your agenda, economically speaking? Would it be that issue? Or? That'd be pretty high. And to continue, of course, the things that we've already put in place. Any other specific economic policy you would, you would put high in that agenda? Well, yes, there are things. For example, the Grace Commission did such a wonderful job. And you know, that was a follow-up to something that I had tried when I first became governor of California. And for these some 250 top executives to volunteer their time and the financing of their work. They didn't cost the government a penny. They raised $76 million to finance what they did. Well, we have implemented several hundred of their recommendations, but a great many more remain uh, not in place because they require legislation. And that would be a top target to get the legislation for more of those things. Given the problems you've had with Congress in these areas, do you think any president can ever affect the kind of change that you're talking about, fundamental institutional change, without a real either a change in the party leadership in that uh, body or fundamental reform? Well, there's one of the things that I think must take place is party leadership. For example, for over half a century, there have only been four years in which the Democrats did not have, uh, well, I was going to know I'm saying that wrong, uh, for only four years that they didn't have the House. And then I was overlooking the six years that I had at least one House, the Senate. We couldn't have achieved anything that we've achieved if we hadn't had that, that one House. And I think a large part of this is due to a correction that should be made in the Constitution. And that is that every 10 years we reapportion the districts to make sure that they, uh, they can remain supposedly consistent with the interests of that particular area and the people in that area. Well, for a half a century or more, the other party has been in charge of doing that reapportioning. And it has been a half a century of gerrymandering as was evidenced in the last election in California, when more people in California voted for Republican congressional candidates than the Democrats had voting for theirs. But the Democrats elected more because of the way the districts have been gerrymandered. You think this explains the difference between uh, the tendency of the public to vote Republican in national elections and yet to elect Democratic Congresses? Well, I suppose there are some people, remember I was a Democrat once. Yes, sir. And uh, I didn't think it was too bad that Eisenhower at that time had a Democratic Congress. But um, I've come to see that it isn't what so many of us just kind of uh, assumed, that it was part of the 
checks and balances of government. Well, if it was, then how come when the Democrats had presidents, uh, they also had Democratic Congresses? If it was a part of the checks and balances, then we should have had Republican Congresses. So I've come to recognize that, uh, and well, I learned an awful lot as governor because seven of my eight years as governor, I had a Democratic legislature in both houses. Do you think, uh, or I should put it this way, what do you think is the most important reason the American people, irrespective of their party, uh, should elect George Bush uh, this fall? Uh, uh, what, what would be your number one reason of, to give to the electorate to make that choice? Well, because very obviously, and he's made it very obvious, this would continue the things that have brought about the recovery, that have reversed the situation we found when we came here in 1981. Not only in national security has it been reversed, but also in the economy and the, uh, well, a higher percentage of the potential workforce in America is employed today than ever in our history. Things of this kind. The employment ratio. Yes. Was, yes. And it is very obvious that uh, Mr. Bush's opponent uh, would take us back to that big government philosophy that government has the answer to all the problems. You know, sometimes, I mean, been what I'd like to quote to him, I think it was Roosevelt that made a statement once that belongs on our side of the ticket now. And that is, he said, if the people of this country do not have the capacity for self-government, then where among them do we find that little elite that can not only run their own lives, but run everybody else's? Well, that's... He would, that was describing what this present philosophy on the other side is, that government must make the decisions and so forth. Well, our Constitution itself, the thing that makes it different from virtually every Constitution in the world is, all those other Constitutions are documents in which the government tells the people of those countries what they can do. Now, Ours is no, we the people. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I didn't we mean, the people. Yes, sir. That our document says, we're telling government what it can do. Yes. Uh, Governor Dukakis argues that uh, even President Reagan has had to sign a few tax increases in the last few years. Uh, why do you think, or why would you argue that Vice President Bush's commitment to no new taxes uh, will be any stronger than what this administration has been able to withstand? No, I believe he's going to continue. It's true uh, that when, when we got in there, there were some things that were handed to us once the Ways and Means Committee stopped. Uh, you're uh, referring the, to the early tax bill. Yes, tax bill. that yes. we hadn't asked for. Yes. And uh, there, there have been, had to be some minor changes there. But the basic philosophy is, I learned this 1,200 years ago from a fellow in Egypt named Ibn Khaldun. Yes, sir. Who said at the beginning of the empire, the rates were low and the revenues were great. At the end of the empire, the, rev the, the rates were great and the revenue was low. I've, uh, I've noticed throughout most of my life that, uh, that tax cuts have been followed by increases in revenue. This happened when Coolidge was doing it, after World War I. It happened the only reduction since the advent of the income tax in 1913. The only reduction the Democrats have ever been responsible for was John F. Kennedy's. And his cut, his, his tax program was very similar to what we ourselves implemented. And when he did it, the revenues were higher. Now the Republicans have been responsible for some 14 reductions of the income tax. Yes, sir. Conservatives argue that the Reagan revolution um uh, those who think it or has been a real revolution are worried that it's uh, fragile enough so that uh, a Democrat could quickly repeal most of it. Do you share that concern? Well, if they've got that power uh, and they believe in that philosophy of theirs, you have to worry about what would happen to it. It's, uh, do the people have a full understanding yet of what has brought about this recovery, this reduction of inflation, the reduction of unemployment, 17 and a half million new jobs uh, created. And contrary to, again, what the Democratic candidate says, about 65 percent of those jobs are above the median income. They are not 
little menial jobs out here that... Uh, Why do you suppose they have been so successful in keeping the American people off balance about the economy? You have the situation now where I think a record number are, have confidence in their own personal economic future, but over half of them say they want an economic, a change in economic policy. Why do you suppose there is that kind of schizophrenia? Well, I'm wondering what they're talking about with a change in economic policy. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm sure that maybe part of it is a fear of the future, because if you look back for a half a century, every several years we had a recession after that Great Depression. And uh, maybe this is what the people are worrying about in uh, the very fact that they keep being reminded by the pessimists that uh, it's been X number of years since the last recession. So maybe they're just, they're fearful, but uh, if you pin them down on their own situation, they, uh, they feel fine about it. Do you think the media have been partly responsible for this kind of negative uh, uh, view of the economy that seems to pervade uh, the public uh, thought? Well, after you ask a question. In, in spades, except for a few journalists <laughs> like a man named Brooks, uh, <laughs> I think there have been uh, distortions. But the other thing I've noticed is uh, when I go out and make a speech and talk about some of these facts and figures, then, for example, I look at myself on TV, and the, there I am coming out, standing up there, and I say a few inconsequential things that I usually do about opening a speech, and then suddenly you still see me talking, but you don't hear me. You hear a voiceover telling you what I said, and they miss all the points that have to do or that have any importance. <laughs> How do you keep your sense of humor in the face of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I get mad. <laughs> but uh, you, know, you have a, you couldn't, well, Lincoln said it when people were criticizing him for telling jokes and so forth. And Lincoln said, I couldn't perform the duties of this position for 15 minutes if I couldn't laugh. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Well, very kind. Well, Appreciate it. Listen, I just want an opportunity to tell you that I'm a fan. Well, I'm a fan of yours, as you well know, sir. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that as a journalist. Well, but, uh, but I, I read, believe me, and you are so sound. My degree was in economics. Yes, I know. And, uh, we last talked, uh, I sat next to you for an hour on Saturday night, 1984, uh, in uh, one of your sessions with the journalists. Uh, and uh, it was a great treat. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Bye bye. Good to see you.